Hey everybody and welcome back. This is Mr. Arvitas. I'm here to talk to you today about the Cold War. Uh, this is going to be a multi-part lesson because this is such a big topic and in U.S. history, world history, this is one that you, you tend to cover and you tend to go through all these different events and when you think about the Cold War, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we're going to try and tackle it little by little by little because you know if you start looking at just everything going on, you have political ramifications, you have wars, you have the space race, you have the fall of the Soviet Union. So there's a whole bunch that can go into this, but we're going to really kind of focus in in this video talking about the early stages of the Cold War. So we're talking really like 1945 going through 1955, 1960, somewhere in that range. Um, not necessarily going to talk about the, the Korean War. We're going to do that in the next video, but we're going to get started now. So the Cold War starts largely because of a number of different things. You know, World War II, massive event, and you had the friendship between the allies, right? That's Great Britain, that's the United States, and that's the Soviet Union. But was that really a friendship, right? They were kind of like frenemies in a lot of ways because Stalin is looked at by a lot of these people. Churchill especially thought that he was one of the largest mass murderers in human history. And so he often wondered, why are we you know, making deals with him? But the allies needed the Russians to win. And you see that in the war. The Russians really push the Germans across Eastern Europe and are the really kind of the, the straw that breaks their back at the end of the day. So we needed them to win. Now, Early on, we knew this was going to be an issue. Uh, the first couple of meetings at Tehran, that didn't go very well. We knew Stalin had some aspirations of Eastern Europe. But really, in 1945, in early 1945, when they meet at Yalta, this is the meeting where basically Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt are going to meet and they're going to decide the fate of the rest of the war. And one of the things that Stalin brings up is that he wants to occupy Eastern Europe. And he basically makes a very valid point. You know, the Russians have sacrificed by far the most of any country in this war. And he believes that they need to occupy this territory to ensure that their borders are secure and to ensure they have a buffer from future agitations. Now, Churchill kind of looks at this and says, no, Stalin just wants to take over. And so Roosevelt in, at Yalta is the ultimate appeaser in a lot of ways. He kind of looks at Stalin and says, look, you know, kind of looking at Churchill saying, look, I know the Germans are going to fall this year, but the Japanese are a ways away and we may need them for the ultimate invasion of Japan because that's the idea. Remember, nuclear bomb is not done yet. So the invasion of Japan is a very real thought and they would need Russia to complete that. So Church, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt are going to agree Churchill very begrudgingly, but Roosevelt agrees to let Stalin occupy parts of Eastern Europe so long as Stalin has elections. And these elections are supposed to essentially uh, determine the, the self-government of these, these territories. Now, of course, letting Joseph Stalin run elections is a laughable process. I think everyone involved knows exactly what's about to go on, but still, that's where we get. And it's at that point that we start to see the, the early stages of the Cold War manifest itself, and it's going to grow and grow and grow. Now, as we know, as the war ends, specifically the war in Europe, uh, Roosevelt is dead, and we get another conference. And, and in fact, in Great Britain, Churchill is knocked out of office. He doesn't even win re-election in, in May of, of 1945. And so as the war ends, the two leaders of the United States and Great Britain are out, and the one leader who still remains from that conference is Stalin. And at Postum, which is a suburb in Germany, uh, at Postum, Stalin is going to kind of impose his will a little bit and kind of say, look, no, we're taking Eastern Europe. Uh, now, he does pledge to still let them have elections, pseudo-elections, pseudo if you will. Um, everyone kind of knows they're very much rigged. And it's new U.S. President Harry S. Truman who's going to have to try and make this. Now, some people uh, fault Truman with starting the Cold War. I, I tended to fall in that category, but I think as you kind of research this a little bit more, uh, Roosevelt, with the appeasement at Yalta, kind of really starts this process. Now, Truman, because of a lack of understanding of the Soviets and of Stalin, is going to make these matters even worse. And so Truman has a very aggressive approach to Stalin, does not necessarily want to really communicate with him, doesn't want to talk to him very much. And so Truman is going to have a very anti-Russian stance. Now, that's all well and good because the war is still going on, and so they can kind of just... Get, get along with these things. Now, Stalin also understands a very key fact. And so some people have asked, well, why didn't the U.S. and Great Britain just go and attack the Russian army? Well, one, they probably wouldn't have been victorious. I think that's something that's extremely important to understand. Outside of using tactical nuclear drops, the United States and Great Britain probably would not have been able to break Russians' military hold on Eastern Europe. That would have been very costly. It would have cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives to do. And keep in mind, the United States and Great Britain are two democratic countries. So all of these politicians have to worry about elections. And if those elections uh, are going to take place and you've just started a new war, Truman will be in trouble. Okay. Now, Harry Truman, though, is going to be the first Cold War president in a lot of ways. And so as the peace is made, right, and there's a lot of stuff that has to be done with the peace process, you know, you're talking 
talking about uh, the creation of the state of Israel, which takes place afterwards. Uh, obviously, what do you do with all the Holocaust survivors? And there's there's a whole bunch of different issues there. But more specifically, it becomes about the, the remaining countries involved in that European territory. Uh, and so... When you look at a map, I mean, I should have a map next to me, right? You have the Russians in Eastern Europe and you have the Americans and the British in Western Europe. And so as we go along through 1946, we start to see these relations start to deteriorate. Uh, and then 1947 is really where the Cold War kind of kicks off. And there's gonna be a couple of major events that take place to really kick off the Cold War. One is gonna be the Marshall Plan. Uh, the Marshall Plan is put together by George Marshall. Remember him? He's the guy who planned out the Allied offensives. He was the, the, the chief of the army, right? And, and he is uh, going to be the guy who plans out this, this big bailout for Europe. Over $13 billion are going to be given to European countries. We're, we're looking at, uh, and I'm going to name them all, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, France, Greece, Ireland, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and Western Germany. Um, and as part of this Cold War, by the way, Germany was divided into East and West. And so this plan, $13 billion to go to these countries that were war-torn. There were two other countries that were supposed to get money in this, and that was Czechoslovakia and Poland. However, the Soviet Union did not want them receiving any money, and so they blocked it. And this is going to be the start of, of a really dangerous game that's going to be played in the Cold War. And that kind of brings us to the whole term itself. The Cold War is not an actual war itself. It's a giant game of chess in a lot of ways between the Soviet Union and the United States. And, the, and they're going to use the rest of the world as the pawns. Okay, And so they're going to be attacking each other through proxies in a lot of ways. Uh, there is no real hot war that takes place. The United States doesn't go to war with Russia. Russia doesn't go to war with the United States. Um, but anytime we're in a war-type territory, you better believe the opposition is going to be funded by communists or vice versa. When Russia is in a territory, we will be funding opposition. Now, as far the Marshall Plan, did it actually work? Well, yes. I mean, we're talking some countries increasing their GDP by 25% in a couple of years. We're talking multiple countries just coming out of depressions almost instantaneously within a year. Uh, it really builds up Western Europe to be an economic power. Their manufacturing increases and, and picks up you know, very, very quickly. Um, and so by 1950, a lot of these Western European countries are economically thriving. But whose products are they also buying? The United States. Because the United States is selling imports to all of them. So the U.S. is exporting large amounts material. Europe's bringing them in via imports and they're buying them. So U.S. companies make a fortune. And that's why the 1950s in a lot of ways is looking at this business-wise a huge decade for the U.S. because we're importing, 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 importing. Now keep in mind, there's a Pacific version of this strategy as well that took place in Japan and we tried to institute it in Korea, which resulted in the Korean War. And we also tried to institute it in Vietnam once the French pulled out. And so we do see uh, more Marshall plans kind of take place. Now Marshall, for his credit, is going to rebuild Europe and reconstruct a lot of these great cities and, and really give the people of Western Europe uh, their homes back. And for that, uh, Marshall will receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 1953. So good stuff. Now, as far as we get back to Truman, now Truman believed in a couple of different things. Uh, he was very skeptical about the USSR. And he believed in what would eventually be known as the domino theory. So if you know what dominoes are, right? A domino, you flick one and it knocks the rest of them down. And so what they believed was that if you took countries and one became communist, it would then lean on the next country and that would become communist. And so in an individual region, you could get a whole bunch of communist countries if they all were connected. And so Truman fears that. The fear is that communism will take over large parts of the world. And by the way, they have some cause for this because what you see is the Soviet Union communist. By the late 1950s, we see China emerge as a communist state. We're going to see the North Koreans emerge communist. Uh, we're going to see the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese under Ho Chi Minh emerge as communist. And so Truman believes in this domino theory. Now, whether or not it's accurate is kind of ludicrous and, and hard to really maintain. Um, but we will talk about why these countries do turn to communism in the next video. And largely it deals with poverty. Okay. It deals with imperialism, post-imperialism fallout. Now Truman is going to adopt uh, what will eventually be called the Truman Doctrine. Okay, the Truman Doctrine in 1947 is one of the single most important policies of the United States because it becomes our foreign policy. Almost like the Monroe Doctrine of the 1800s, it is the new 20th century version. And in a lot of ways, he uses the Monroe Doctrine as a basis. And now what he says is it is vital to U.S. interest to maintain countries against communism. He wants to do the policy of containment, right, where you essentially put them in a little compartment. Okay, you're going to be communist in Eastern Europe. You're going to stay communist, but we're not going to let it spread. We're going to contain that. Kind of like, you know, I guess right now we're being contained from infecting each other with diseases, whatever. So 
that's one of the Truman's big strategies, the containment policy. Now, that containment policy seems pretty innocent on its kind of face, but it becomes very dangerous very quickly. And obviously, we see the Korean War is going to erupt a large part because of containment. And Vietnam will also be another containment-based war. So that's going to be some of the things that we have to kind of look at going forward. However, in 1947, when he does this, there are two places that he's really looking at to try and contain. Um, and that's Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And he wants to make sure that they don't have the whole territory. And so he's going to give a lot of money to Greece and Turkey. And so Greece and Turkey in 1947 are going to receive large amounts of aid. Now, this is going to aggravate Stalin to no end because Stalin did have envisionments of taking over Turkey. That way he could control southern ports for the Soviet Union. Uh, and then also Greece, which was right at the edge of Eastern Europe. And so the United States put soldiers in these areas. They put money. They put weapons. Eventually, right, we, we have Jupiter missiles uh, in, in Turkey. And we have, we have you know, long-range missiles in Greece and in Turkey that could strike Soviet assets. Assets. So they're going to fund these two territories. Now, why do they do that? Some people take the naive approach, and I don't want you to take the naive approach. Don't say, oh, well, Greece was the birthplace of democracy. Yeah, a democracy that was very limited and had a bunch of slaves and everything else. But the reason they really did it was strategic, right? They wanted to make sure that they had that, that Mediterranean coastline. They wanted to make sure that they had eyes on the Soviet Union. It was an easy place for, for U.S. military bases and everything else. So that's part of the reason they're doing it. And it, and it also causes the Soviet Union to kind of shuffle its own, its own kind, of, kind of way going forward. Now, Truman is immensely important in this kind of process. And it's kind of weird. Like some people don't always give Truman the amount of credit he should get. Uh, Truman does do some very good things. One of the things I always like to point out is in 1940, 49, when he desegregates the military, he says, you know, if soldiers can die, they can die together. And he desegregates the military. It's the largest desegregation in the history of the country at that point. And it's the first time a federal agency has been desegregated. And I think that's really important. It kind of kickstarts that civil rights movement. Um, and we do see the early stages of the civil rights movement taking place right after World War II and then into the 1950s under Truman and then eventually under Eisenhower. Um, but we can talk about how these presidents use and don't use civil rights at all uh, during their administrations in a different lesson. Um, now, Winston Churchill, who comes back into power in England, by the way, is going to call the Soviet Union the Iron Curtain. And he says an Iron Curtain has been put all over Europe. And Churchill is going to advocate, along with Truman, for the creation of a new type of organization. And that's going to be NATO. Uh, the United States uh, and NATO are, are going to be kind of synonymous with, with, with each other. And so we're going to create NATO uh, during this time period in 1949. Uh, NATO is really, really important. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it encompasses most of the North American countries. It encompasses just about all of Western Europe. And it's kind of like a if they attack us, we all go at them type thing, mutual defense policy. Now, some of you might be thinking, isn't that World War I? It is, except they didn't have nukes in World War One, So attacking everybody means mutual destruction. And so there is that kind of, you know, we can either blow the whole thing up or we can work together. Now, I actually kind of skipped a beat, but we're going to rewind for a second to 1947 again. Um, there's this little territory called Berlin, right? Berlin was the capital of Nazi Germany. Now, Berlin has been divided into East and West Berlin. And, you know, Stalin wants all of Berlin. So he cuts off all the trains. The U.S. had been putting trains into the into Berlin. Because remember, if you look at the map, Berlin is in the middle of Soviet-controlled East Germany. However, the U.S. has a presence in Berlin, and they've been just training people in and doing air, you know, bringing up planes in and everything else. And so Stalin says, nope, we're cutting off all the trains. We're cutting off all the travel. You can't come in. And so the U.S. is going to say, no, we're going to break that blockade, and they're going to do airlifts into Berlin, and they're going to airdrop food. They're going to bring in supplies and everything else. And so they're going to be flying that. Ironically, Ironically, in 1947, one of the last soldiers to die who was drafted into World War II, you know, or, or enlisted because of World War II, dies in a plane crash during these uh, airlifts. But they're going to be airlifting people into Berlin, uh, airlifting supplies, uh, weapons, uh, and various other things for the U.S. Army station there. And this is really going to aggravate Stalin. Ultimately, the Allies or NATO wins in this, and Stalin says, fine, you can have West Berlin. And eventually, they're going to settle. Once Stalin's dead, they're going to build a giant wall there, obviously, the Berlin Wall which we will talk about um, when we get to our famous like tear down this wall, Ronald Reagan speeches, right? So that's, that's really where we get. Uh, and by 1950, we have kind of like some interesting things kind of also going on. One, at the end of World War II, the United States had one chief advantage over the Soviet Union, and that was nuclear weapons. 
And that's a huge advantage, right? Nuclear weapons present a massive deterrent for the Soviets. However, in 1949, the Soviets had their own nuclear weapon and they tested it out. And of course, now the world was scared and we were like, oh, we got to do this. And this creates an arms race with the Soviet Union. And so we, of course, have our hydrogen bomb in 1952. We both start to work on ICBMs. We both start to work on submarines that can launch nuclear weapons. And before you know it, right, we're all nuclear and we're making our friends nuclear and we're putting different places in there. And this will eventually get us to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is low loads and loads of fun uh, going forward anyway. Now, this brings us to communism as a whole. Uh, now, some people have asked, and I've actually, in a bunch of my classes in our little meetings on Teams, uh, we've been looking at communism and people have said, well, well, why does it work or why doesn't it work? And the, one of the things I, I want to point out is that just about every country that became communist during this time period uh, did basically absolutism or, or, or totalitarianism. Stalin in particular, right? He is horrible, right? He murders millions of people and he makes you know just really just suspends rights and everything else but we have to understand what communism really kind of thrives on communism thrives on poverty it thrives on people being desperate just like when hitler with nazism that was a desperate policy people did that because they wanted to be successful they wanted to get out of the depression well communism's the same way and so when you have these countries and i want you to think about each country that i talk about because they go to they go towards communism for very interesting and very legitimate reasons. You know, look at the Russians, right? The Russians had dealt, you know, prior to 1917, had dealt with a totalitarian society with, with the czars. They had these nobles who had these huge amounts of privilege. You had serfdom that was rampant, that was eliminated, but wasn't eliminated. The workers had no rights. They suspended the press, all these different things. And, and then they keep losing wars, right? They lose the, the Russo-Japanese War, World War One. They're getting decimated. They don't have enough food. And they're like, this is horrible. And so they turn to communism because what communism at least promises you is an equality, right? You're not going to have noble privilege in communism. You're going to be equal. Now, what they didn't always realize is that communism also suspends your rights. And so there is a balance and it's an interesting balance because we're talking about it today with coronavirus is what's more important, your safety and collective success or your liberty. And for the people in Russia, they chose safety and collective success. Stalin says, look, order is the most important thing we can do, right? That, that will be the ultimate success for Russia. It's not individuality individual people. And so that's one of the things I think you have to understand about communism in Russia. Now, when you look at other places, it makes even more sense. China, I mean, good God, the 1800s were bad for China, okay? They had been walked on by imperial powers, and that gave them a really distrust of, of Europeans in general. The poverty in China was just massive, of course, and you had those noble elites, right? Uh, the scholar gentry elites, as we talk about in AP World. Uh, and then you also have in China, uh, the Japanese, right, invading, and the Japanese taking over large amounts of territory. Then after World War II, you have the Russians and the U.S. both saying, What's up, dude? Why don't you do what we say? And the Chinese are like, no, nah, hell no, right? And so they're going to have their own little civil war that plays out. And Ho Chi Minh, or not Ho Chi Minh, Mao Zedong, right? Ho Chi Minh would be Vietnam. Uh, Mao Zedong is going to take over in this kind of like movement where he's really popular with rural people, redistribution of farms. He's going to make people equal, take away the poverty. China had been decimated, right? For 40 years, it had been just a train wreck. And now all of a sudden he brings order out of that. And for the Chinese culturally accepting communism, uh, it wasn't like they were giving up that much because these rights weren't there to begin with and everything else. Now, if we flip the script and we go to Korea, Korea, once an imperial holding of China, then an imperial holding of Japan also fought a nice war of independence, also being pressured by the Soviet Union. You know, Korea is going to go towards communism because in North Korea, they were desperate. They were poor. They were starving. They had famines that killed a million people uh, right after World War II. And so Communism was the answer. It was the economic answer. The Soviets were supporting the, the North Koreans. Now in the South, they don't go to democracy. Don't think that. More capitalistic, more free market, but they support that in, in that way. Now Vietnam, now Vietnam's the easiest case I think we can make for, for why communism took over. Vietnam, you have the post-imperialism, right? You have the French who are trying to hold on to this. And the French have, have controlled Vietnam. And, and we get into the 1950s and the Vietnam finally expelled the French only to have the U.S. say, wait, you can't do that. Time out. You need to be just like us and everything else. And that's where Ho Chi Minh's like, hell no. Look, I'll be very honest. Ho Chi Minh, as far as like communism goes, yeah, he's communist. But, you know, one of their leaders he looked up to was George Washington. That was his military guy that he really thought was the man, right? Defeats a big power using, un, un, you, know, you know, common techniques, guerrilla warfare and everything. 
But Ho Chi Minh is not going to be accepted by the U.S. because of communism. And so he's going to turn toward uh, more Chinese and then more Russian aid going forward. And, and that's where we get the whole Vietnam War thing going on. And the people in Vietnam had struggled, right? France abused Vietnam left and right. You know, this is a place that had famine, but they were producing the most rice outside of China in the world. How is that possible? And so they turned to communism. Cuba where we're gonna kind of leave off in this video. Uh, Cuba turns to communism for different reasons, okay? Cuba turns to communism because it had been controlled really since the Spanish, remember it was a Spanish colony, so it had Spanish conquest, then the US liberated it, quote unquote, in the, in the, the Spanish uh, US war, right? However, the U.S. had maintained a lot of control uh, in a lot of ways, very similar to the Banana Republics, where we propped up governments. You have Batista and all these different guys, and we're propping up these governments. And Cuba you know, looks and they say, wait a second, the majority of our property is owned by U.S. investors. How is that possible? And the majority of Cubans were poor, and so they liberated, right? We get Castro uh, coming in and Che Guevara, right? We get these guys who kind of just liberate uh, or, or expel the capitalists, if you will. Now, make no mistake, let, let, let's be very realistic about what Cuba was, right? Cuba it becomes very, very strict right away, right? There's massive arrests for dissidents. All of these different places that we talked about are going to kill people. They're going to murder people, arrest people, but they also are going to institute public education, institute, institute health care, introduce basic standards of living, which is something these territories had never had. So, you know, you do have a, a little bit of a weird balance in there, but these communist countries all come about because the people are poor and that's just the very nature of it. And that does bring us to Cuba. Cuba is an interesting kind of part of this whole thought, you know, thing. Um, because Cuba becomes communist in the late 1950s. And Castro actually tried to meet with Eisenhower, Dwight D. Eisenhower, president of the United States. But Eisenhower was off playing golf. He played golf uh, almost as much as any president ever, um, though I think our current one plays golf a little bit more. Uh, and there are obviously the more modern presidents play golf a lot. But Eisenhower's a big golfer. And so he was playing golf and didn't really want to meet with him. And he leaves him waiting for a long period of time. And so Castro kind of gets embittered by this. But guess who was there to pick him up? The Soviets. And the Soviets are like, hey, dude, like we like you. We support you. We'll, we'll back you up. And so Castro is going to take a lot of a lot of Soviet money. He's going to really turn towards full-fledged communism. And he's going to you know kind of go about it that way. Interestingly enough, Eisenhower, after all this takes place, 1959, 1960, begins to organize a attempted coup over uh, Castro. And that coup, which will eventually be fall under Kennedy in the Bay of Pigs incident, um, that coup is going to be organized by the CIA, where they take these Cuban refugees who had escaped and they're going to arm them, they train them, they're going to do a covert op, they're going to land in Cuba, start a revolution, kill Castro, and form a capitalist country. That's the plan. What could go wrong? Well, Eisenhower in 1960 is like, well, I'm done. I'm not running for president anymore. And we get this nice young president named John F. Kennedy. Okay. John F. Kennedy is elected in 1960, takes over office in 1961. And immediately he's in a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff where they're saying, this is what we're going to do in Cuba. We need you to sign off on the plan. Uh, we're going to invade. What do we do? And so Kennedy immediately in office, and keep in mind, this is the youngest elected president that we had had, and he immediately has to make a decision. Am I going to invade Cuba? Am I going to allow this to happen? Now, he listens to his generals. And by the way, I personally think this is what's going to prevent catastrophe two years later. Kennedy listens to his generals, and they are going to invade Cuba. Um, not a U.S. invasion, but remember, those little proxy forces, those refugees are going to kind of come in. We're going to land them with the CIA, and they're going to try and revolt. We call this the Bay of Pigs incident. Now, the Bay of Pigs is a colossal failure. As things start to deteriorate on the ground, and the Cubans begin to fight back, and they begin to beat our, our little uh, forces, um, there's messages basically saying, look, President, we could bomb them. We could use our air force and we could disable most of Cuba's military and we could overthrow this country in two days. But if we do that, the Soviets are going to be really mad and we don't know what the retaliation is going to be. And so Kennedy has to weigh this decision and his generals are like, bomb, bomb, bomb. And Kennedy says, I don't know. I don't know. And then before he ever really makes a decision, he does say no. Um, but once he says no, by that point, it's almost too late and the forces have been routed. They capture them. It's a huge embarrassment. Cuba is very public about this. Look what the U.S. did. And the Bay of Pigs is done. Uh, and Kennedy is now looking like a weak foreign policy president. There's also another thing that's going to take place with Kennedy during that same time period. 
JFK is going to have a meeting with uh, Nikhil Khrushchev, who's now the, the premier of Russia. Stalin's dead. Khrushchev in. Uh, Khrushchev, big general, World War II. Uh, Khrushchev, when he meets with, with Kennedy, is kind of taken aback by Kennedy. You know, Kennedy suffered from a lot of health problems. He had back problems, so he had to take a lot of painkillers. But he said, I need to be sharp. I can't take anything when I meet with Khrushchev. And the flight and everything else had made him really uncomfortable. And so as he's meeting with Khrushchev, he's wincing. He's moving a lot. He's sweating. And Khrushchev's sitting there thinking and staring at him like a, you know, a stone cold killer. And he's saying, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. I got him. I got him in my bag. And so Khrushchev is going to make a very big gamble. He's going to put nuclear weapons in Cuba. And this will be known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, 13 days that determine the fate of the world. And the Cuban Missile Crisis is one of these things. I could talk about this for hours and hours. It's a really cool event. Um, but long story short, the United States discovers that Russia, the Soviet Union, has been putting missiles, nuclear warheads, uh, into Cuba. Cuba is 90 miles away from, from the United States. Uh, with these, they could have early launch. It might even be able to disable our nuclear war capabilities. And so Kennedy is going to have to make some decisions. His generals want to bomb it. Uh, first strike mentality. Some of the generals are talking about the global catastrophe. And Kennedy is kind of like, just hold, you know, we need to take a time out for a second. Uh, Khrushchev also, I think the more you research this, you discover that Khrushchev, once it really starts to escalate and it turns into, hey, I got my hand on the button and so do you, Khrushchev is also looking for a way out. Neither leader wants to be the one responsible for the, the global catastrophe that nuclear war would be. And it's going to be essentially 13 days. Kennedy is going to blockade uh, ships coming into Cuba and ships leaving Cuba. Um, and they're going to have a, a secret negotiation. Actually, Kennedy's brother does a lot of the secret negotiation. And the U.S. is going to agree to a number of different things, including removing missiles from Turkey. Uh, and then Russia agrees to remove missiles uh, from the, the, the Cuban islands. And this is really important because for both leaders, it means two totally different things. Uh, Kennedy celebrated this is a win at home for Khrushchev. It's kind of almost a loss in a lot of ways. And so we get the two different kind of narratives uh, from these two leaders. And, and that's going to really kind of dictate a lot of things going forward. Now, in our next lesson, we're going to be looking at specifically the Korean conflict and then the Vietnam conflict. So until next time, Mr. Arvidas, take it easy, guys.